life of the Marquis de Lafayette. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Joe Samaritano. I'm a member of the class of 1991. Uh, I work in the Office of Development and College Relations, and I'll be your host for this evening. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First, the presentation will last for approximately one hour, and it will be recorded. Participants should remain muted throughout the entire presentation uh, to ensure that there's no background noise. We invite you to include your full name and class year in your profile and turn off your video during the presentation. One suggestion we have is uh, you might want to click on the dash at the top right corner of your screen so that you can view the slides in their entirety and not have them blocked by the speaker or other participants. Uh, we, we ask that you don't use the chat function during the presentation as it will distract from the final presentation. At the end, you'll be invited to uh, submit questions via the chat and I'll then present them to the speaker. Our speaker for tonight is John Bessica. John is a life member of the American Friends of Lafayette, the historic society honoring the marquee. The AFL was formed at Lafayette College during the college's centennial celebration of its first classes in 1932. John's an officer of the Lafayette Alumni of the Lehigh Valley, the home chapter of the Alumni Association. He's a member of the Sons of the American Revolution, an assistant researcher and treasurer for the Lafayette Trail Project, and a loyal and dedicated Lafayette alumnus. John graduated from the college in 1969, and after hearing a lecture on the life of the Marquis de Lafayette at his 30th reunion, he realized little had been said during his college years about the Marquis. As a result of that lecture, he began, began reading about Lafayette, joined the American Friends of Lafayette, and in the last few years, he has been delivering his lecture about this important person in our country's founding to current Lafayette students, parents, alumni, and other members of the college and Eastern communities. His recent experiences include traveling to see the arrival of the Hermione -Owned at Yorktown in 2015, touring Lafayette related sites in Boston in 2016 and Annapolis in 2018, and attending, the York, attending Yorktown Victory Day in 2017. Through his experiences and ongoing research, John is constantly refining his presentation. This will be my fourth time viewing the presentation, and I have to say it gets better every time and more informative. I think you're really going to enjoy learning about our college's namesake tonight. And now here's John Bessica. Good evening, everyone. I would like to start the presentation this evening uh, by quoting a very important person in our history, Professor Al Gundabeen. He was a loyal alumnus. He was a history professor at Lafayette for many years. Uh, in retirement, he became the first college archivist. And he wrote a sequel volume to Skillman's biography of a college. He's speaking in 1989 to the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. And I quote, a few years ago, a student from a neighboring institution, Lehigh, interviewed me about co-education at Lafayette College. In the course of our talk, she asked me, why is the college named Lafayette? Was he a local benefactor or something? Well, Al continues, I need hardly tell you what happened to my esteem from my colleagues up the river. Well, hopefully tonight, no one hearing this presentation who received their primary and secondary educations in this country would ask such a question. Well, Lafayette is known as the hero of two worlds for his roles in the American and French revolutions. My talk today will only consider how he affected the United States, his early life, his role in the American Revolution, and his two return visits to America. We have a lot to cover, 200 pages in a typical biography. So I would ask, as Joe mentioned, that you wait to put your questions in the chat, chat box until the end of the presentation. In 2002, Congress finally recognized Lafayette as an honorary US citizen, only the sixth person to be so honored in our country's history. So who the heck was this guy? What was his background? What did he look like? What motivated him to come to America and get involved with our war with England? How did he come to be such a celebrity in America? These are some of the issues I will address in this presentation. 
Lafayette's parents, in the French aristocracy of the time, marriage had nothing to do with friendship, compatibility, love, romance, or even lust. Marriages were arranged for young people by their elders with two goals in mind, the consolidation of power and prestige and the merger of family fortunes. In Lafayette's case, his father came from a long line of military noblemen, and his mother's family was exceedingly wealthy due to their exhaustive land holdings in the Brittany section of France. Lafayette is born September 6, 1757, at his father's family ancestral home, Chateau Chavagnac, a stone castle built in the 14th century in Auvergne, France. The day after his birth, he is baptized with his big long name. His friends called him Gilbert. As Saint would have it, he would grow up as an only child. But here we have a map showing Paris in the north, the big blue star, and Auvergne down in the south. This is Chavagnac today. You can go visit it. It's currently owned by what we would call the county government in our country. And uh, I have several views of it. This shows the territory around it, very much like our Appalachia in America. And here are three modern views of Chavagnac. Lafayette supposedly was born in the right-hand tower that you see here. In this, on the second floor. You can't see the first floor because of all this hedging, but that is supposedly where he was born. Lafayette's father, one of a long line of soldiers in the family, was killed in action in the Battle of Minden in Prussia during the Seven Years' War with Britain. Lafayette was only two years old and thus did not know his father. He inherits the title Marquis de Lafayette for his father's death. Lafayette's mother, pregnant and stricken with grief, leaves country life and returns to her family's Luxembourg Palace apartment in Paris and the aristocratic world she knows. There she gives birth to Lafayette's sister, who dies less than three months later. She returns to Chavagnac to visit several times a year. Lafayette is fortunate in being raised by paternal family members. It was common for the nobility of the time to farm one's children out to be raised by governesses, nurses, and other outsiders. Lafayette is raised at Chevagnac by his paternal grandmother, Madame de Bautier, and his paternal unmarried Aunt Madeleine. Another paternal Aunt Charlotte, a widow with her daughter Marie, who is one year older than Lafayette, joins the family when Lafayette is five. Lafayette regards his cousin Marie as a sister. His early education, mainly in French and mathematics, is provided by several tutors, one of whom is a religious abbot. Lafayette's cousin Marie dies in childbirth when Lafayette is in America. He later recalls her death as one of his greatest sorrows. The formative years in Auvergne. In contrast to many in the aristocracy, Lafayette's grandmother, while running Chaviac, is regarded as a respected and benevolent man, uh, woman by the local peasants. This is the first hint you have of Lafayette thinking of the equality of man. He makes a point of filling Lafayette with glorious stories of the adventures of all his soldier ancestors who are pictured throughout the castle. Lafayette thus develops a distaste for the British who killed his father. He acts out his military fantasies by roaming the estate playing war games, mock battles, and military parades with the local peasant boys. In his memoirs, Lafayette recalls, from the time I was eight, I longed for glory. I remember nothing of my childhood more than my fervor for tales of glory and my plans to travel the world in the quest of fame. While his further fervor for glory is fueled by a desire to, peace, to tame the beast of Gévaudan, which appears on the scene when Lafayette is only eight years old. The mysterious beast is allegedly roaming the hills and murdering women and children, generating tall tales and folklore. Lafayette recalls, my heart beating with excitement to slay the hyena, the hope of encountering it enlivened my walks. Thus, Lafayette's lifelong philosophy is formed, honor, glory, and liberty purchased at the price of courage, are the only goals in life. 
At age 11, Lafayette's mother takes him to Paris to live with her at the Luxembourg Palace. Away from Auvergne for the first time, he is amazed that people do not tip their hats to him as Lord of the Manor. Interestingly enough, I took a tour of the campus with Professor Madison not too long ago. And before we left to walk around, he showed some slides and he showed this building. It turns out that this building, Lafayette's first home in Paris, is the same architectural style as R.D. Hall. Just to have a small coincidence, but it's true. He enrolls in the four-year college of Nancy, just down the road, where as a member of the sword nobility, he is unusual. Most students come from the less prestigious nobi nobility of the road where rank is based on judicial or government service. A few are even from bourgeois backgrounds on scholarship. It is here that Lafayette studies Latin and Greek, makes his first friends, and starts to exhibit traits of leadership. It is here that he excels in Latin scholarship. On April 3rd, 1770, when Lafayette is 12 years old, tragedy strikes. His mother dies and her father, his grandfather, passes away three weeks later. Lafayette is now an only child orphan in the care of his great-grandfather, the Count de la Riviere. His inheritance makes him a multi-millionaire, one of the richest people in France. Still burning with a desire to have a uniform, at age 13, his great-grandfather arranges for him to enter the Black Musketeers, soldiers of the King's Guard. He enjoys the ceremonial duty, but still wishes for a true command. Fabulously wealthy, Lafayette is now considered a great catch for those noble families looking for marriage partners for their daughters. While on vacation at Chevenac, age 14, Lafayette learns that arrangements have been made for him to marry Adrienne, second daughter of the wealthy and influential Noai family. Her father, Jean-Paul Francois de Noir, the Duc de Anne, has five daughters to marry off and wants to limit his dower exposure. Lafayette's mother is furious because she does not want her 12-year-old to marry until she has finished school and matured. The battle rages between Adrienne's parents, but a compromise results in Lafayette moving in with the Noir family for two years for the youngsters to get to know each other. Lafayette knows he will marry Adrienne, but she does not. In a twist of fate, he likes her, and she falls head over heels for him. It will turn out to be the beginning of a great love story. Once the arrangements are finalized in April 1773, the Duc Dayan procures a lieutenancy in the Noir Dragoons for Lafayette and procures private lessons for him in military subjects. At about the same time, Adrienne's older sister, Louise, is betrothed to Louis by Comte de Noailles, a cousin of the Duc d'Anne. Lafayette and the Viscount soon become fast friends in the Dragoons, as does Lafayette and Louis, Comte de Segur. Now you may wonder why uh, they're arranging a marriage with a cousin. Well, what happened was the Noailles family had two boys and they both died as infants. So, the Duke de, de uh, Noailles wanted to, uh, to have a male continue the name. So he marries off his oldest daughter to a cousin. Lafayette marries Adrian, April 11th, 1774 at the Hotel Noailles in Paris. She is 16, he is 14. As a wedding present, the Duke de Anne has Lafayette promoted to captain in the Noailles Regiment. He is expected to receive command of a company at age 18. And the couple continues to reside with her parents. Three months after Lafayette's marriage, Louis XV dies, and his grandson, Louis XVI, with his Austrian bride, Marie Antoinette, ascends to the throne of France. Lafayette is now enrolled in the Academy of Versailles, offering instruction in comportment and manners for children of the nobility at the king's court. A country boy, he does not fit in with the other upper students who have been practicing such things as dancing with grace and riding like a gentleman officer all their lives. 
Lafayette's contemporaries in the nobility described him as being tall, stop that at 6'1", redheaded, gawky, clumsy, awkward, shy, reserved, a bad dancer, a poor writer, and having cold, reticent manners. His close friends even say he has a cold and serious bearing, which sometimes creates a false impression of timidity and embarrassment. But they reveal what is underneath, an active mind, a resolute character, a passionate spirit, and a brave and generous person. And certainly he was generous. He had no concept of money and gave it away right and left. Lafayette is trapped in a situation for which he is suited. He does not fit in at court, as his father-in-law wishes, and has no desire to. At one point, Queen Marie Antoinette breaks out in laughter and is dancing. Lafayette seals his fate at court when he deliberately insults the brother of Louis XVI and is not invited back. In May of 1775, Lafayette sets out for his second summer of Noir regimental exercises in the French town of Metz near the German border. Count de Broglie, then governor of Metz, becomes interested in Lafayette. He brings him into his circle of friends and introduces him to influential people. Lafayette, about to turn 18 in September, enjoys the attention of the senior officer and likes de Broglie who in actuality is conducting covert operations for the king, looking for ways to attack Britain. De Broglie has considered the idea of aiding the Americans as an opportunity for France, as well as an opportunity for him to replace George Washington as commander of the Continental Forces. Thus in August, Lafayette is invited to dinner by De Broglie with Prince William Henry of Gloucester, out of favor brother of Britain, King George III. The prince is passing through French France on his way to Italy. He is in sympathy with the American rebels and recounts stories of the battles of Lexington and Concord, Ethan Allen capturing Fort Con Ticonderoga, a Continental Congress having met, a Continental Army being formed, and continuing military tensions around Boston. This is a watershed moment in Lafayette's life. Before he leaves the table, he imagines going to America to aid the Patriots. He believes that American freedom will influence the safety of France against the country that had caused his father's death. But there was another thing to consider. The French government was about to restructure how it populated its military due to the Seven Years' War debacle. No longer would just birth succession determine who stayed in the military. Competence and experience now counted. Lafayette's path to glory would eventually become blocked but on June 11, 1776, he was forced into the reserves and out of active duty. Both de Broglie and Prince William Henry were Masons and may have been influential in Lafayette becoming a Freemason during this period. Lafayette's membership in this fraternal society would serve him well in America as Washington, Franklin, Hamilton, Hancock, and a number of other influential patriots were also Masons. The Lafayettes welcomed their first child, a daughter, Henriette, in December of 1775, when Lafayette is 18. The French government is sending spies to America and seeking an alliance with Spain against Britain, but openly staying neutral. Lafayette starts his plans to come to America. He confides in his two close friends from the Dragoons, his brother-in-law, Nawai, and his friend, Segur, who both would like to go, but they lack funds and are forbidden by their parents. Just after the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, Silas Dean arrives in Paris from America seeking soldiers and help for the Patriots. The Broglie introduces Lafayette to German soldier of fortune, Baron de Kalb. De Kalb and Lafayette meet with Dean. Baron de Kalb is an interesting character. He was born a peasant and he decided to improve his situation by calling himself a baron. So he just called himself a baron. Unfortunately, he died in South Carolina during the revolution. Lafayette does not want payment for his services, but he does want recognition by being appointed a major general in the Continental Army. Amazingly, Dean gives him his wish. 
When asked, why go to America? Lafayette's answer is, why not? He puts these Latin words on his coat of arms. Kurnam, why not? After some intrigue, when Lafayette's father-in-law learns of the plan and runs to King Louis XVI to forbid it, Lafayette, DeKalb, and their party sail for America on April 20th, 1777. With all the uproar about his departure, Lafayette has unwittingly scuttled the Broglie's plans to go to America and take over George Washington's command. Lafayette, at age 19 and a half, finds out that he is not a good sailor and spends the eight-week voyage being seasick and trying to learn English and military tactics. He writes a long, effusive letter to Adrienne, who had no knowledge of his plans and is pregnant with their second child. The ship anchors off Georgetown Bay, South Carolina on June 13, 1777. Lafayette and his party row up the river, see lights, and are entertained in true Southern style at the summer home of Major Benjamin Huger, who fortunately speaks French. Huger conveys them to Charleston, where they buy horses and totally unsuitable light carriages for the 900 mile trip to Philadelphia. The trip is filled with hardship. The equipment disintegrates, horses die, mosquitoes attack, and the travelers come down with swamp fever and dysentery. While the other officers complain, Lafayette remains deep. Back in France on July 1, 1777, Adrienne gives birth to their second daughter, and names her Anastasia. Lafayette will not know of this for months. Prior to Lafayette's arrival, the American Revolution was progressed through several phases. The Boston Tea Party, Boston Massacre, Battles of Lexington and Concord, and Bunker Hill have all taken place. The British have sailed away from Boston for New York City and have won the Battle of Brooklyn. Washington and his army have barely escaped across the East River to Manhattan and have lost that as well, fleeing across the Hudson to Fort Lee and retreating across New Jersey to Philadelphia. At Christmas of 1776, Washington's army has crossed the Delaware River to surprise the Hessians at Trenton. I threw this slide in here just because I like it. It's good of a militiaman and a Continental Army person. Following a victory at Princeton, the remainder of the winter is spent in camp at Morristown, New Jersey. In the spring of 1777, the army moves to the colonial capital of Philadelphia to protect it from the British who sail forces from occupied New York City around the tip of New Jersey into the Chesapeake Bay and land at Elkton, Maryland to attack. All right, now we return to the action. Lafayette's bedraggled party reaches Philadelphia and is rebuffed by members of Congress who are tired of being bombarded by obnoxious egotistical French mercenaries sent by Silas Dean. Lafayette returns to his quarters and writes a letter to Congress. He says that after the sacrifices he has made, he has the right to two favors, serve at his own cost and to begin his service as a volunteer. That and an endorsement by Benjamin Franklin does the trick for him at least, and he is introduced to George Washington at the City Tavern on August 3rd, 1777. Washington is in his 40s with no biological children. Lafayette will turn 20 in a month and is an orphan. They take to each other and form a father-son relationship that will last until Washington's death. And by the way, in case you find that kind of relationship far-fetched, Something very similar happened to me recently. Now, I'm not comparing myself to Washington, mind you, and he would not compare himself to Lafayette. But in the summer of 2017, during the American Friends of Lafayette weekend here at the college, I hosted a young French graduate student at my home. And in 48 hours, I knew I was dealing with an extraordinary young man. We bonded like Washington and Lafayette, and he is now like the grandson I never had. His name is Julian, and I will tell you a bit more about him later in the program. Lafayette joins the ragtag army one week later as part of Washington's family, his aides. About the same age as Hamilton, Burr, and Monroe, endears himself by saying, I have come to learn and not to teach. Washington, however, soon becomes troubled 
when he realized that the, that the young Lafayette expects an actual command, not just the honorary title of Major General. Washington is now tasked with preventing Gen British General Howe and his forces for overrunning Philadelphia. He holds a strategy session with a general at Mullen House, southeast of Doylestown, where Lafayette attends his first council of war. The Battle of Brandywine. House forces are advancing north from Elston, Maryland to attack the colonial capital. On September 11, 1777, the Continental Army intercepts them at Brandywine Creek in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, southwest of the city. So here, here we have a, a number of oil paintings of that. You have to realize that none of this was done contemporaneously. These are idealized uh, depictions of what the artist thought at the time. Here Lafayette is with his raised sword at Brandywine, another depiction of how the artist thought it might have looked. While Lafayette does not have a command, he is front and center, trying to organize the eventual retreat. He takes a bullet in the left calf, a flesh wound, but keeps on until his boot fills with blood and aides re remove him from the field of battle. The Continentals have been routed by the British. Washington sees to it that Lafayette is cared for by his personal physician. He is taken by water to Philadelphia and then north to Bristol, Pennsylvania. Henry Lawrence, president of the Continental Congress, drives him by carriage to the Moravian settlement of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, to recuperate for four weeks. He spends the first several days at the Sun Inn. And then is hosted at a private home for the remainder of his recuperation. The Sun Inn still stands. It's been restored. If the pandemic wasn't here, you could probably have dinner there. There's a scene from inside the restored inn. And it was quite noisy in the inn. So after a couple of days there, Lafayette was moved to a private home, the home of George Frederick Beckel. And there he's cared for by Mrs. Beckel and daughter Liesel. There's an interesting story uh, that Lafayette became enamored of Liesel. But Nobody knows if it, it can be proven because the only source of it is word of mouth down to the Beckel family. Who knows? Lafayette's fame is beginning to spread throughout the colonies. He actually claims he is ecstatic at having been wounded. He becomes the spin doctor of the time, writing letters promoting the Patriot cause and magnifying his exploits to friends and family in France as well as the key ministers in the king's government. Meanwhile, Washington tries a surprise attack on the British who are camped at Germantown, but fails to stop the eventual overrun of Philadelphia. Continental Congress members are forced to relocate to Lancaster and later York, Pennsylvania. The Liberty Bell is transferred to Allentown, Pennsylvania, where it is hidden under the floor of a church. Back in France, Lafayette's first child, Henriette, passes away at age 22 months. But again, it will take months for Lafayette to learn the news. Rejoining the army, Lafayette is given his first command of General Green. British General Cornwallis is across the river in New Jersey. Lafayette is given 400 men for reconnaissance. He attacks the Hessian outpost of Gloucester and the Hessian retreat. He presses on until Cornwallis arrives with backup and then retires. Washington now makes a major decision to give Lafayette command of the division. At this point in the war, Washington has been able to push the British out of Boston, but he has lost the Battle of Brooklyn, lost control of New York City, and lost the colonial capital of Philadelphia. His two small victories have been the surprise attack on the Hessians at Trenton and the victory at Princeton. General Horatio Gates, fresh from his tremendous win at Saratoga, wants to overthrow Washington as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. He convinces Congress to make himself president of a board of war, and in concert with General Conway, they lobbied to remove Washington as commander-in-chief. 
Lafayette is anguished by this disloyalty and in his still boyish way, emotionally and steadfastly supports Washington. The attempt to overthrow Washington failed. The army no, now goes into a well-known partnership at Valley Ford. While camped at Valley Ford, Baron Steuben from Prussia is credited with shaping Washington's Continental Army into a well-drilled machine. News of an alliance with France arrives at Valley Ford on May 1, 1778, along with news of Lafayette's second daughter, Anastasie's birth, nine months after the actual event. Three months earlier, on February 6, 1778, the day of the treaty signing in France, Benjamin Franklin, Silas Dean, and John Adams had been presented to King Louis XVI. They then went to visit Lafayette's wife, Adrienne. Lafayette, the spin doctor, is credited for the alliance due to his adventurous departure from France and his letters home with exaggerated tales of adventure and success. While in camp at Valley Forge during the winter of 1777-1778, Lafayette writes this sentence in a letter to his father-in-law that we have inscribed on the pedestal of his statue. In the succeeding sentence of the letter puts it in context. He does not want to appear as an egotistical person coming in telling him what to do. Interestingly enough, when I was a student at Lafayette, the two male schools used to delight on in Lehigh Week of trying to cause damage at each other's campuses. And some of you may remember the, the, the outdoor statues being put in plywood boxes. Well, one year when I was there, someone took spray paint and wrote on the box, I read, I study, I examine, I listen, I reflect, and out of all this, I try and figure out why the hell they put me in this box every year. In May of 1778, at age 20, Lafayette sets military leadership skills at Barron Hill, today named Lafayette Hill, southeast of Plymouth Meaning, Pennsylvania. Washington receives intelligence that the British, having heard of impending arrival of French warships, are readying to evacuate Philadelphia. Wanting to know if this is the truth or a ruse, places Lafayette in charge of a 2,200-man reconnaissance mission. Washington causes, cautions Lafayette not to be surprised by the enemy and lose his best men. Well, any of you who have raised teenagers know that you try and tell them the right way to act and what to do, and they don't listen. So Lafayette didn't listen. He found a nice place in a high clearing and camped there for two days, and he was found out. British General Howe, in his last days in command, gets wind of the mission, and cockily sends out British forces to surround and capture Lafayette, whom he sarcastically refers to as the boy. According to Lafayette's later writings, Howe goes so far as to invite the leading the Frenchman, who he expects to have as a prisoner by nightfall. Howe's plans fail when Lafayette realizes he is being surrounded by 5,000 enemy troops. Making observations from the steeple of the Lutheran Church, his team, he leaves a few men to make a lot of noise for the British, and his main force retreats down a low lying road out of sight of the enemy. By the time the British close the trap, Lafayette has escaped. What Lafayette did in this situation was he had some Oneida Indians with him. And about a dozen of them would, would fire shots from behind a tree, scamper behind another tree, fire more shots. And the British thought that there were a lot of uh, soldiers there. And there weren't. There were just a handful of Indians who were making a lot of noise. And that allowed Lafayette and his troops to escape single file on a low lying road and get away. The Battle of Monmouth. Led by Sir Henry Clinton, the British evacuate Philadelphia and set off for New York City by land across New Jersey. At a council of war, Lafayette and the other generals advocate a full assault on the enemy. Major General Charles Lee and Benedict Arnold lead another faction, saying they are no match for the British. Washington decides on a middle course. 
The Continentals will harass the withdrawing British, but will be willing to engage if the British make a stand. Thus, Washington and his army pursue the British across the state, culminating in the Battle of Monmouth, June 28, 1778, the longest contest of the Revolution, fought in oppressive heat and humidity. Lafayette lobbies for and is put in charge of a force of 4,400 men to attack the enemy's left flank and rear. This would normally have been Lee's command as a senior officer. Lee has second thoughts and asks for the command back. Washington agrees and Lafayette defers to the older Lee. At one point, Lee disobeys Washington's orders to attack and retreats. Washington is furious. Overnight, the British slip away. Lafayette becomes even closer to Washington. He recalls that they passed the night on the same cloak discussing Lee's actions. The Battle of Monmouth goes down in history as a and Lee ends up being court martialed. The next little section of my presentation you will not find in, in any general biography of Lafayette, because it's my, about my hometown of Hohokus, New Jersey. The army is on the move after the Battle of Mammoth, and Lafayette is in, charge, is in charge of one of three divisions. They stop in the Great Falls of Patterson, New Jersey to have lunch. Alexander Hamilton is with them at the time. He gets the idea later when he's Secretary of the Treasury to harness that falls and Patterson, New Jersey becomes the first uh, continental manufacturing city in the country. Dr. James Henry, who's an aide to the Prime writes, the general received a, a note of invitation from Mrs. Prevo to make her hermitage, as it was called, the seat of his stay while at Paramus. At Mrs. Prevo, we found some fair refugees from New York who are on a visit to the lady of the hermitage. So there's a bunch of, of ladies who have come over from New York. We, we talked and walked and laughed and danced and galanted away the leisure hours and four days and four nights. Many towns can boast that Washington slept there, but my hometown can, can boast that he danced there. Theodosia Prevo, the mystery of the mistress of the hermitage will later marry Aaron Burr there in Hohokus, New Jersey, which is back then Paramus. While they're there at the Hermitage, Washington receives word that the stang has arrived off Sandy Hook, and he enlists Lafayette's aid in communicating with him. Because of my dual interest in Revolutionary War history and Lafayette, I was the one who discovered this letter from Washington to Lafayette saying that while we were, they were socializing at the Hermitage, Washington was told that Queen Marie Antoinette had sent Martha Washington a gift, but it had been confiscated in New York by the British. And he asked Lafayette to find out if he can find out anything from Adrienne about it. And it turns out that we don't have a, a replying letter, so we don't know how that came out. So. This, this is the Hermitage as it probably looked during the revolution. And in the 1800s, it was in, enlarged into a Gothic revival mansion, which is still there today. You can go visit it. It was preserved because one family owned it for centuries. Back to the action. Newport. The Stang fi finds that New York Harbor is shallow for his ships debating an attack on New York City and agrees to sail to Rhode Island. Lafayette is sent there with a troop detachment. When he arrives, General Green is given half his force. Lafayette arrives in Providence on August 4, 1778 to find that Sullivan has not gathered the militia together. The Stang ships have arrived, but they are out of food and suffering from there is a nine day delay during which Lafayette acts as a diplomat shuttling back and forth between Sullivan and the Stang. The plan to attack Newport is finally agreed to, but Sullivan jumps the gun by a day. The Stang is furious. 
the British fleet arrives and the Stang starts to engage them, but a storm breaks up both fleets. The Stang refuses to pursue Newport and sails to Boston for repairs. Lafayette and Sullivan almost get into a duel. Lafayette rides to Boston to urge rapid repairs and the Stang's return. He returns to Rhode Island two days later, but the British fleet shows up on the Continental's retreat. A major battle for Newport never really happens. While in Rhode Island, Lafayette writes this well-known quote about his feelings for America. The moment I heard of America, I loved her. The moment I knew I was fighting for the freedom, I burnt with a desire of bleeding for her. And the moment I shall be able to serve her at any time or in any way in the world will be the happiest of my life. Pretty heady stuff for a 21 year old to say. Lafayette's fame has now spread throughout the colonies. This is his real signature. He is referred to widely as our Marquis. Ironically, it is about this time that Lafayette, filled with the idea of liberty for all, drops his title when signing his correspondence. After that, he calls himself just Lafayette. And after the French Revolution, when he renounced his title, he called himself General Lafayette for his generalship in the Continental Army. The winter is coming and Lafayette, seeing a lull in the fighting, now asks for a leave of absence from the Continental Army to go home and see his wife and surviving daughter. He also has dreams of talking Louis XVI into invading England. He is granted the leave and Congress writes the King glowing reviews of his service to the American cause. Before he can leave, however, he succumbs to a serious fever after a long At Fishkill, New York, he is attended to by Washington's physician, Dr. John Cochran. Lafayette is sick for several days and almost dies. Here's another revolutionary doctor. Dr. Thatcher, who wrote all of his doings down during the revolution in a book called Thatcher's Military Journal. The reason I'm using him is for a quotation he has in this book. He visits Lafayette while he's convalescing. And here we find an eyewitness account of what Lafayette really looked like. Nearly six feet high, large but not corpulent, not more than 21 years of old, is not very elegant in his form, perfect symmetry in his feature, high forehead, large and long nose, prominent eyebrows, hazel eyes, and we know that he's a strawberry blonde. His countenance is interesting and impressive. He speaks in broken English. So he recovers and Lafayette finally sails for France on July 11, 1779 on the Frigate Alliance, the jewel of the young American Continental Navy. He will spend a little over a year in France. On arrival, he is treated as a hero. The king cannot compare with his popularity and only puts him on a short house arrest for disobeying when he left France to join the patriotic effort. His reunion with Adrienne results in the birth of another child in December of 1779. Lafayette names the boy George Washington Lafayette. And George Washington becomes the boy's godfather. Lafayette would love to don a French uniform and fight the British anywhere, but his lobbying finally results in France agreeing to send an expeditionary army and naval force to America to aid the Patriots. Lafayette is itching to be its commander, but it is not to be. The force will be headed, led by Count Rochambeau with Admiral de Grasse in charge of the French Armada. The king, however, gives Lafayette the honor of going ahead of the force to inform Washington that they are coming. Lafayette dons his colony for on March 1780 aboard the new French frigate Hermione. He lands at Boston on April 27, 1780, and soon joins Washington in camp at Morristown, New Jersey, where he gives him the good news. These are the statues on Morristown Green. Before I saw this uh, tableau, I never realized what a tiny little man Hamilton was. Lafayette's about 6'1", Washington's about 6'3", and Hamilton is really small. 
Rochambeau and his forces arrive in Rhode Island on July 10th, 1780. Complement of men includes Lafayette's close friend from the Noai Dragoons, his brother-in-law, Louis, I count the Noai, who will later serve with Lafayette at Yorktown. During the mid to latter part of the year, Washington keeps the Continental Army in the vicinity of New York City, camping in several different spots in today's Bergen and Passaic counties in New Jersey. He is considering an assault on New York City. In August, two brigades are selected from the different regiments of the main army to find a corps of light, light infantry commanded by Lafayette. The Marquis is delighted with his command and at his own expense provides them with extra equipment. Friendship between Lafayette and Hamilton deepens, and Lafayette makes several suggestions for appointments on Lafayette's behalf. By September, Washington and Lafayette are at West Point when Benedict Arnold is unmasked as a traitor. His wife, Lady Sherman Arnold, learns the news and acts like a deranged woman. She completely fools Washington, Lafayette, and Hamilton, and they let her go back to her family in Philadelphia. Historians later find evidence that she was just as guilty as she was. And by the way, she was a friend of Theodosia Prevo, and on the way back to Philadelphia, she stops there overnight and confesses to Theodosia and Aaron Burr that she has just been putting on this big fake screaming match to uh, get away from being caught. In February of 1781, Washington sends Lafayette south to Virginia. Lafayette first meets Thomas Jefferson and they become lifelong friends. Lafayette is able to scare off the British from a battle for Richmond by making it appear that he has more forces than he does. Richmond, as supplies and armaments, is saved. But later, after supplies have been hidden in the hills, Richmond is evacuated. Lafayette continues a holding action with his small force until reinforcements arrive. Washington and Rochambeau have finally agreed that an assault on rested troops in New York City makes no sense but striking British General Cornwallis in Virginia does. French troops from Rhode Island join American Northern forces on the trek down to Virginia along what today is known as W3R, the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route. Here we have making battle plans for the Battle of Yorktown. This painting is interesting because there are several biographies of Lafayette that identify the people incorrectly. And if you go down to the uh, New Revolutionary Museum in Philadelphia, they have this painting blown up on the wall and it's incorrect down there as well. Lafayette, is, Washington's in the middle here. Lafayette's in his shadow with his nose and his mouth in the shadow. And they incorrectly define this guy as, as Lafayette, and it's not, it's Rochambeau. In the first place, Continental Army uniforms were buff and blue like Washington, uh, buff, yeah, buff and blue like Washington has on, and he's got white and blue in a very fancy uh, uniform. We believe that's Rochambeau, this is Lafayette. Again, some paintings of what artists later on thought this might look like. and actual paintings of the battle. This is Washington, his aide Tench Tillman, and Lafayette in the middle, again at Yorktown. And another one of Allied commanders with Lafayette on the left. James Armistead, a slave, served as a spy for the Marquis de Lafayette during the American Revolution at Yorktown. Later, as a free man, James changed his name to James Lafayette. Now, the British thought that he was a runaway slave working for them, but he was really a double agent. He was working for Lafayette and his master had allowed him to work for Lafayette. This painting on the left is, is Lafayette at Yorktown. Some people believe that the groomsman is supposed to be James Armistead. It's not been yet proven that. 
but I would, I would uh, direct your attention to the composition of this painting to look at the next slide. This monument in Prospect Park was patterned after the painting you just saw. A copy of Lafayette's figure later became the statue in front of Colton Chapel on our campus. There's an interesting story behind this monument and this statue, which I have recently researched and written about. Uh, Communications Division at Lafayette has a copy of it, so you, you may, may see it. But um, basically the monument was put there because a gentleman of French extraction in his will gave money for the monument. And he was so interested in Lafayette because he remembered uh, kissing Lafayette's hand when, when this gentleman was six years old during Lafayette's last visit to the United States. And how this became recast to be the statue in front of Colton Chapel is also interesting because it all uh, relates back to a chance meeting on a train between a Lafayette alumnus and Daniel Chester French, who was the, the uh, sculptor of the statue. So what was Lafayette's major con contribution to assuring that we are an independent nation today and not British subjects? Surely his letters home following Brandywine helped move the French government to send the Stang and his forces. And surely his lobbying on his return to France resulted in the major additional commitment under Rochambeau, resulting in the victory at Yorktown. In four short years, from age 20 to 24, he had gained the confidence of George Washington and promoted himself as a commander on the battlefield as well. Lafayette returns to France in triumph at age 24, arriving home in January of 1782. The fame he has acquired in the American War propels him to the rank of Marshal de Camp in the French army. In September of 1782, the Lafayettes have their last child, a girl, and Lafayette names her after his adopted father's home, Virginia, and the location of the Battle of Yorktown, Virginia, and he names her Virginia. Two and a half years later, in 1784, Lafayette returns to America for a five-month visit at the invitation of Washington. He travels to 10 states from Virginia to New England and has two long visits with Washington at Mount Vernon. It will be the last time he sees his adopted father. During the trip, Maryland grants citizenship to Lafayette and his male heirs, a very important point which we will soon discover. The college happens to own this painting, by the way. And again, we have artists' ideas of what it must have looked like Lafayette visiting Washington at Mount Vernon. While visiting, Lafayette discovers that his faithful James Armistead is still in slavery. He lobbies the Virginia legislature and is successful in having James emancipated. It, uh, blacks who served in the Continental Army earned their freedom. Spies who served the Continental Army did not, according to Virginia law. And that's why he had not been emancipated earlier. This broadside that Lafayette wrote is another item that is owned by the college. Lafayette returns to France on the frigate La Nymph, but it will not be his last visit to his adopted country. So one of my quests in, in uh, learning about Lafayette is to find out what he really looked like. There are so many different oil paintings and engravings of him, and sometimes you don't even know that it's the same man. Well, this is what Lafayette actually looked like at age 28 because the Houdin took a life mask of him. And from the life mask, he made the bust you see on the right. The original of this is in the Virginia State House and Lafayette College has one in the entrance to special collections at Skillman Library. And you may have one yourself. There's a 
can't make for make uh, reproductions of this very bust. As I mentioned earlier, I'm really not going to talk about Lafayette's role in the French Revolution, except to say that uh, he took a, a middle of the road point of view. He wanted a constitutional mar monarchy such as Britain has today. And as a result, the leftists hated him, the rightists hated him, and he eventually had to flee the country. And of course, he fleed into territories that had monarchs of their own and considered him a rebel because they, were, they thought he was after uh, getting rid of kings and queens. So he ends up in prison for a total of about five years. After the, uh, the reign of terror, uh, where many of the, the uh, high class people of France lost their heads, including Adrienne's mother, grandmother, and older sister, Louis. Um, Adrienne asked to have she and her daughters go into prison with Lafayette. And that essentially saves his life because he hasn't seen or talked to anybody for over a year. My friend Julian, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quote him about how the French think of Lafayette today because he's not thought of as well as in France as he is here. He says, Lafayette has sunk into oblivion in France as the national memory doesn't recognize his achievements. Today, the liberals don't hold him up because he supported the monarchy and the conservatives don't embrace him because he was a troublemaker who championed the rights of the people. Adrienne using Lafayette's citizenship in the state of Maryland has been able to keep their son, George Washington Lafayette from harm. She has sent him to stay with his namesake in America. He stays for a time with Alexander Hamilton in New York and later with Washington in the President's House, Philadelphia, and out Mount Vernon. After the Lafayettes were released from prison, Adrian takes charge and is able to get the Lafayettes repatriated to France, where she recovers this property, which had been confiscated during the French Revolution. It was her grandmother's property. She and Lafayette will live here for the rest of the day. And the college owns this painting as well. This next slide I find interesting because on the left we have a painting of a painting. Uh, it shows Lafayette's bedchamber at Lagrange with the painting hanging over his bed. Lafayette requested of George Washington that he send him a painting of himself and Washington did that. And the painting on the right is another thing that the college has the honor of owning. The nation's guest, Lafayette's 1824-25 Triumphal Tour of America. 40 years after his visit in 1784, President Monroe and Congress invite Lafayette to return to his adopted country. He is 67 now, and having lost his fortune in the French Revolution, is financially strapped. As part of the trip, he is presented with dollars and a land grant in Tallahassee, Florida. During the 13 month tour, he, his son, George Washington Lafayette, his secretary, Auguste Levasseur, and his valet Bastion visit all 24 states, some of them twice. He travels by land and water, and at one point is even shipwrecked on a riverboat, but escapes unharmed. When he visits Massachusetts, he lays the cornerstone for the Bunker Hill Monument and his son collects a trunk full of soil to be taken back to France. Everywhere he goes, cities and towns try to All sorts of souvenir memorabilia are produced and hundreds of locations named for him. Cities, towns, parks, streets, businesses, Lafayette, Fayette, and Lagrange all refer to the hero of two worlds. While in Philadelphia in September of 1824, Lafayette greets a delegation from Eastern Pennsylvania led by James Madison Porter, an event which results in the family founding of Lafayette College. Not too long ago, I was standing in the checkout line and I noticed a young man behind me 
who had on a Norwich University shirt. And I said, oh, you got a Norwich. He says, no, my older brother. Well, do you know the, the connection between Norwich and Lafayette College? And he said, no. So I quickly told him the story. In 1824, in the fall, a delegation floated down the river to, to Philadelphia to see Lafayette. Now, Lafayette was totally open to meeting anybody. Native Americans, black slaves, black freedmen, rich, poor, anybody. That's the way he was. And they go through this receiving line and he meets Porter. And he says, Porter, who's a fellow that served at Brandywine with me. And James Madison Porter gets really excited and says, yeah, that was my dad. And Lafayette, with his wonderful memory, says, and there was another man who was a young man fighting with him. And Porter says, yeah, that was my mother's brother, my uncle. So Lafayette wishes the family well, and Porter walks away just totally elated from this. About a month later, he takes a young relative, I'm assuming it was a nephew, up to Vermont to enroll him at Norwich University. He gets on campus and he gets this idea in his head, why can't we do this in Easton? Well, while he's there, they give him, him uh, papers and he crosses the, the Connecticut River and to Hanover, New Hampshire, and he visits Dartmouth. Well, now he's really convinced that Easton should have a college. So as a result of this, he puts an ad in the, in the local newspaper. There's a meeting at Chippy White's Hotel and Tavern on the northern side of the square in the eastern quadrant. Just after Christmas of 1824. And at that meeting, naming the college Lafayette is a no brainer. It takes over a year into March 9th of 1826 to get uh, the charter. This is the, the event that we celebrate in recent years as Wine 39 or Dine 39. And it takes six more years to get the college going, and they get it going by having Reverend George Junkin move his manual labor academy from Germantown down by Philadelphia, and he takes up the charter and a rented farm on the southern bank of the Lehigh River in Easton, and the rest is history. If it hadn't been for the triumphal tour of 1824-25, our college would not have such an illustrious name. And while we were talking about the farewell tour, let me tell you this story. In 2015, at the arrival of the Reconstruction Association at Yorktown, Virginia, members of the American Friends of Lafayette first met French student Julian Isha, who was doing graduate work at the College of William and Mary. By the way, if you're interested, Google American Friends of Lafayette. It's a great group. Every early June, they visit another place for a long weekend that has to do with Lafayette. They have a wonderful newsletter, Gazette, they put out. Check them out. Well, Julian got very interested in the Marquis and our society and returned from France for our 2016 annual meeting, which was held in Boston. While with us at a function at the French Consul General's residence, Julian proposed working with the consul. The result was that he developed a project and was hired as an intern to map General Lafayette's footsteps throughout New England during the farewell tour. Julian's education is in history and geography, and he holds master's degrees in geography and in geographic information systems. So this project was a natural for him. He spent five months in 2017 visiting all the places where Lafayette trod in New England and creating an interactive mapping program documenting the exact route. 170 stops that the general made are shown with images and text at each. The project is called the Lafayette Trail, and you can view his work at the lafayettetrail.org. Once his New England internship was over, Julian came back from France to finish mapping the remaining 18 states and a total of over 800 locations that Lafayette visited. In addition, Julian has lectured about the trail to 800 historians, 
written many articles for publication, and has received significant publicity for his efforts to increase mutual understanding between the peoples of France and the US. The Lafayette Trail Incorporated, his 5013C company, has formed an exclusive partnership with the William J. Pomeroy Foundation. And Julian is currently working with them to install historical signage along the route and preparation for the bicentennial of the tour in 2024. To give you a feel for the magnitude of this, Pomeroy Foundation will make donations for between 150 and 175 markers to the tune of $150,000 to $200,000 for manufacturing and shipping. Julian was also honored to be a member of the French cultural delegation during French President Macron's state visit to the U.S. in April of 2018. With its internet base, this project is expected to introduce millions to learn about the marquee. Expect to hear a lot more about this talented young man. And now I have a brief commercial announcement from the treasurer of the Lafayette Trail Incorporated, me. We are in need of a substantial amount of money to complete installing the between 150 and 175 historical markers along the trail by the bicentennial in 2024. You may help us by joining the Lafayette Trail as a member or by making a donation to our 5013C tax exempt company on our website, lafayettetrail.org. I should mention that you can become a member and get the benefits of membership, but we really need larger donations. It costs us $5,000 a month to keep this project going. So the need is great. We thank you all for your consideration. In September of 1825, at the end of the triumphal tour, Lafayette leaves his adopted country for the last time on the ship Brandywine. Lafayette dies on May 20th, 1834, at 76 years of age, knowing that a college had been founded to honor him in Eastern Pennsylvania. Well, the story is that he went to a friend's funeral in the cold and rain, caught a cold, probably turned to pneumonia. He was starting to get better, and he went out for a ride in an open carriage and got caught in a big thunderstorm. It recurred and he basically died of pneumonia. Do we know that he knew Lafayette College existed? We can't tell for sure, but the Literary Society of Lafayette wrote him a letter and the letter was found in his papers after his death. We assume that he knew that Lafayette College existed and it had been named for him. This is Picpus Cemetery where Lafayette and Adrian are buried. This is where uh, the people who had, were beheaded from the reign of terror with Robespierre were thrown into two open pits. <clears throat> there are over 1,300 killed who were just dumped here. Adrian and other members of the aristocracy tried to find out where their loved ones were buried. And finally, uh, a servant followed the, the cart taking the bodies one day and figured out where it was. And they started a fundraising campaign and bought the cemetery and established a chapel there. Adrian uh, put a, uh, a group of nuns in there who are supposedly perpetually praying for the dead. And this is Lafayette and Adrian's gravesite in the back corner there. And this is a close up of their graves. He is supposedly buried with a trunk full of soil that was brought back from the 1824 25 triumphal tour from Bunker Hill. The interesting thing about this is that the American flag has flown over his grave through both world wars. And that has been enabled because of its secluded position behind the walls of the cemetery. Every 4th of July or thereabouts, we're trying to make it exactly 4th of July in the future, there are memorial services held here. Uh, members of the Lafayette, American Friends of Lafayette always attend that and play a wreath. We have uh, a few members who are French citizens and live in France. And uh, 
The next thing I will show you is jumping ahead to World War I, General Pershing arrives with his forces and parades through Paris and he visits Lafayette's grave. And this is the point at which he is mistakenly a lot of times quoted as saying, Lafayette, we are here. In other words, Lafayette helped us win our war with Britain and now we're here to help France. Um, turns out that he did not write the speech. Colonel, his colonel um, wrote the speech for him. He approved it. He said a few words and then Colonel Stanton read the speech and at the end, and he read it in English. He, at the end, he, he points at the grave and says, Lafayette, we're here. There's an interesting little story about the general, why he didn't do the public speaking. Supposedly, I don't know whether this is true, but it makes it story. Supposedly in second grade, he was supposed to recite Mary Had a Little Lamb in a play and he went blank. And ever since then, for his whole life, he hated public speaking. Recommended further reading for you. If I've piqued your interest, the first book I would read is Harlow Giles Unger's Lafayette. This book was republished for the uh, 200, uh, 250th anniversary of Lafayette's birth, the celebrations we had on campus in 2007. Uh, I think it's the, the best book for somebody to start. If you want a little faster reading, shorter book, very well, very easy to read, I would read the one on the right by Jason Lang. In addition, we have the parent of a Lafayette alum. He's a local guy. Jeff Finnegan, and he's teamed up with local uh, Eastern artist, Preston Hinmark, to produce a series of books on Washington. Jeff's passion is Washington, and one of his books is The Extraordinary Relationship of George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette. These are more written for younger readers, but I would highly recommend them. They're great books. And I would say right now that if you have questions you want to put in the chat box, start, start doing that because we're coming up on the end of the program. In addition, I would, I would refer you to one other item. Um, Stephen Wilson and communications at uh, the college uh, followed Julian and I around New Jersey as we were tracing Lafayette's tour. Uh, I'm a native of New Jersey, so I took Julian around. I'm the only one who accompanied him on his journeys doing this. But uh, we went to Morristown and Wilson wrote a wonderful story about our adventure in Morristown, which uh, we expected to be printed in the Lafayette Alumni Magazine and it never got in, so it's only online. But if you go to the search box on the college website and, and type in on the trail of General Lafayette, you'll find the article, I, I, I recommend it. So now we're coming down to the end of our program. On the left, we have Lafayette reenactor Mark Schneider, who works in the Tidewater area of Virginia, Williamsburg, Yorktown, and Jamestown. And on the right, we have um, ben Goldman, who works out of the Washington DC area. There's an interesting story about Ben. He said he, at, at a dinner I had with him that uh, the second or third time he portrayed Lafayette was uh, with a Washington reenactor. And they were there for the visit of French President Sarkozy. So he said he was extremely nervous, but they got through the presentation and they're having a photo op afterwards. And Sarkozy comes up to Ben Goldman and asks him where he comes from in France. And Ben says, I'm not French. That's how well Ben Goldman speaks the French language. So now we have come to the end of our show. I don't know why these red lines showing up in my slides. I've never seen them before. But, um, so I will throw it back to Joe Samaritano for questions. 
Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, our first question is, uh, whatever happened to Lafayette's kids? Um, they grew up. <laughs> um, George Washington Lafayette, as I said, came on the triumphal tour with him in 1824 and 25. Uh, the two surviving daughters, Virginia and Anastasi, married, had children. Uh, I, in about a year ago, I tried to do the genealogy of the Lafayette family, uh, working from Lafayette towards the present. It's very interesting. Um, this is some of the interconnections between the royal families and so forth. Um, but uh, they all, uh, oh, the, the other interesting thing about the family is that uh, they had a lot of girls. And uh, there, were, there were two sons along the line that could have perpetuated uh, the family name. And uh, one never married and the other son died young. So the name was about to be snuffed out and two of Lafayette's ancestors went to the French government and wanted uh, the Lafayette added to the end of their names. So there are people now in France who call themselves Lafayette uh, and they are blood relations, but uh, not through the male normal uh, transmitting of the name. Okay, John, our, our next question is, is it possible to tour the Chateau Lagrange? I believe it is not. I believe it is currently under renovation and not, uh, not accessible. Okay, while we wait for maybe a few other questions, why don't you tell us a little bit about why we uh, do honor the marquee? Well, you know, the title of the show is Lafayette 101, why we celebrate the marquee. And there are basically two big reasons. Number one, this is influence with the French government. It got the French government involved in the revolution may win the Revolutionary War. Everybody who studied history uh, pretty much agrees that w Washington wasn't doing so hot. And without the French, we would be British subjects today. We would have lost. But that's the one big thing. And the other big thing that he was the first international crusader for human rights. Um, and that's, that's very... Uh, good thing to talk about today because we're, we're arguing about uh, the abolition of slavery and he was an early abolitionist back during the revolution. He was friendly with Native Americans. He worked uh, overseas uh, when the Protestants were being, uh, you know, were being uh, hurt in Europe. Uh, he, oh, he, he, uh, he and his wife bought a plant in French Guiana and uh, tried to show a model of, of uh, freeing the slaves and that the, the economy could work with uh, paid labor. Um, so his international crusader for human rights is, is the other main reason we should honor him. Okay, our, our next question is, do we know who the Lafayette alumnus was who met Daniel Chester French on the train and when did that happen? Uh, yes, we do. Um, his name is not on the top of, the tip of my tongue at the moment, but uh, he, he, was, uh, he became a quite noted artist. In his later life, he was an artist in residence on the campus. And uh, he, it, he was riding a train about two years after the monument in Prospect Park was uh, dedicated. And uh, he had a studio in New York City. And the fellow who had the studio next door to him was assisting Daniel Chester French in the statue of Harvard at Harvard University. 
and they were on their way to Boston, and so was uh, uh, this fellow. And uh, they met up on the train, and he was to uh, Daniel Chester French, and uh, found out that he went to Lafayette College. And they said, well, we've got this plaster model of the, of the statue in the, in the uh, studio taking up room. Uh, why don't we give it to the college? So uh, for the, the, the sum of $10,000, which was not a lot at the time, uh, they recast the statue. And uh, Morris Clothier of the, the uh, Strawbridge and Clothier Company uh, gave the money to do that. And uh, that's how the statue got put up. Okay. We Detweller, have... Detweller. His, the, 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 the alum's name was Detweller. <laughs> Came to me. Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, next uh, question is, how was Lafayette perceived in France after he was released from prison, and uh, and why was he released? Well, he was basically released because uh, Napoleon started winning things. And um, actually, they, there was an attempt to uh, break him out of jail, and it almost would have succeeded. They were out, and they, were, they got recaptured. Uh, Lafayette was not uh, welcomed with open arms back into France. When they got out of prison, they went to Denmark for a while. And it took a while to be repatriated. And basically, uh, he was so debilitated, and Adrian was debilitated as well, but she was the one who, they, they couldn't even afford a carriage. And she walked all over Paris trying to get some some of their lands back and eventually got uh, Lagrange back. But basically, Lafayette was allowed back into France because he agreed with Napoleon that Lafayette would keep his mouth shut politically for a while, which he did. This is not my expertise, the French part of it. I have a more interest in the American side of Lafayette's life. And John, we uh, we have uh, a message here in the chat saying that uh, it was Frederick Detweiler. You 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 got the name at the end there. And right. Nineteen nineteen was uh, was was the year. That sounds about right because the the, the statue was put up in nineteen twenty. I believe. Okay. Well. Uh, it looks like uh, there, there aren't any more questions at this point. So uh, I'm gonna say thank you, John, for, for a great presentation. And, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, please uh, join us for our next talk. It's Lafayette's Path to Coeducation. It'll be held on November 10th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, with uh, Peter Newman, class of 73, and Professor Robert Weiner. Uh, you can view and register for future talks and events by visiting leopardlink.lafayette.edu. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next ConnectEd virtual event. And thank you again for, for joining us tonight. Everyone have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>